Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are here in the sanctuary of New Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, where our pastor is the none other than OBC Lions, proud but yet humble. We are so glad to be here this morning for our Sunday School Hour of Power, and we hope that you would join in with us, so as we prepare to get started, get your Bibles, get your pencils and pens, and all your books and papers that you need, even grab your cup of coffee or your cup of tea, and join in with us. We want all of you to enjoy this lesson with us as we take our walk today with Nehemiah. We will be discussing um, Nehemiah and the second book of Nehemiah, and we'll be starting at the 11th verse. So get ready so that you can walk with us. Once again, we're here at New Bethel Missionary Baptist Church, and we're so glad to be here with this uh, Sunday School lesson. But before we get into our lesson, we're going to have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come this morning just to say thank you. We thank you for our lying down last night. And then early this morning, you touched us. And we were able to look around, get up, walk around. And Lord, I thank you that we were able to get up dress ourselves, feed ourselves. And for that, I say thank you. Because Lord, there are so many this morning who can't do those simple things. And sometimes the simplest things are the greatest things. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. We pray for those who are sick, those who are bereaved, please have mercy upon them according to your mercy and your kindness. We thank you, Lord, for this Sunday school hour. Yes, we yes. pray that something will be said yes, that's yes. going to help somebody. Mm -hmm. We pray for understanding, that yes. you will open our hearts, our yes. minds, our ears to your understanding of the word. Yes. We pray for simplicity and understanding. Yes, yes. Lord, we pray for everyone who are currently feeling weak, broken and lost. Yes, yes. We pray that they will find strength and purpose in you. Yes, yes. We pray that you will guide them through this day and renew their hope and strength. Yes, yes. For all of us, Lord, we need to be renewed. And I thank you and I praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And now we are going to get into this lesson, our teacher for today, our discussion leader, none other than Amen. Sister Simmons. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister King. Our lesson for today is coming out of Nehemiah, the second chapter, and our subject is the captive cupbearer rebuilds a nation. Coming from Nehemiah 2, 11 through 20. We have three outlines for our lesson. Nehemiah 2, 11 through 15. Our outline is pervade the situation. Then we go to 16 through 18. Our outline is call the people to work. Then 19 and 20 is a respond to opposition. Now to start our lesson off, we won't start right now at verse 11 because we want to know what happened in the first verses 1 through 10. Also, we need to know something about Nehemiah and we also need to know about the wall. So first I'm going to talk a little bit about Nehemiah, who Nehemiah was. It said, there are no details about Nehemiah, birth or childhood. Here is, he is the son of Hakaliah and 
He had a brother named Hananiah. He had character traits that would include courage, selfness, godliness, dedication, and perseverance. He was willing to give up the luxury of the palace to toil among his people. He was strong in prayer. He was able to encourage or rebuke at the right time. Nehemiah was a godly man and had great faith in the Lord and was a man of prayer and action. Mm -hmm. Before he set out on his project, Nehemiah prayed. Amen. When he approached the king, he prayed. Amen. When he was in trouble, he prayed. Yes. Amen. What a fabulous example of how to get something done. Pray before you start. Mm -hmm. Pray as you go. Yes. Pray when you're between a rock and a hard place. Yes. Pray about everything. Amen. Nehemiah 2 and 4 say, Then the king said to me, What do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Mm -hmm. He seemed to strike a proper balance between prayer and action, or dependency <coughs> and discipline. Nehemiah was living in Persia and had attained an important and responsibility of responsible position as a cupbearer to the king. Um, Artaxerxes. Our, our okay, the cupbearer was responsible for serving the king his wine and ensuring it was not poisoned. The king ordinarily trusted the cupbearer mm -hmm. greater than we would expect the two would have a close relationship. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah leads the third and last return to Jerusalem after the Babylonians ex mm -hmm. exile in 4, 444 BC. Nehemiah was a godly man and like Ezra understood a worthy mission. Ezra's mission was to rebuild the temple, and while Nehemiah's mission was the rebuilding of the walls of Jer uh, Jerusalem. Yes. His crowning achievement is leading and organizing the people to rebuild the shattered wall of Jerusalem in only 52 days. He also has the task of continuing leadership after the walls had been built. He was the governor of Jerusalem from 444 to 432 B.C. There are no other biblical reference to Nehemiah outside the book that bears his name, and we are not aware or how, when or how he died. Now a background on the wall that Nehemiah was going to help build. He said, let's look at some background concerning the wall. Long before Israel first conquered the land of Canaan, the city of Jerusalem with, with protective walls already existed. The Jebusites lived there in relative safety within those walls. However, King David captured the wall and it became to be known as the city of David. Then King Solomon, David, and Hezekiah expanded the walls to the state it was in before the Babylonians attacked and conquered the Israelites. The temple was destroyed, as was also the wall around the city. The wooden gates were burned with fire. Many of the Israelites were sent into exile. The Babylonians themselves were defeated by the Persian about 40 years later in 539 BC. Nehemiah learned of this troubling news from one of his brethren, Hananiah, who had come to visit him with some men from Judah. With the wall broken down and the gates burned, the city was vulnerable to attack and was also very unsightly. 
With the walls broken down and the gates burned, the city was vulnerable to attack. The walls that were in shambles did not reflect the people that God had blessed. In fact, it came close to representing a defeated people. Nehemiah was burdened by this thought. Ezra had already successfully led the effort to rebuild the temple over 10 years before. Nehemiah became inspired and undertook to undertake the massive rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, the land of his ancestors. Now, Nehemiah never saw Jerusalem in its beauty. Nehemiah was born into captivity. He was in captivity when all of this happened, when all of this, uh, no, he wasn't even born then, but he wanted, he had heard about the city of Jerusalem and he wanted to go back and help rebuild these walls. He had a heart for that. It said, first he was the cupbearer for the king of Persia. Or Xerxes and would have to get permission from him to leave and travel to Judah to head up the project to rebuild the walls. So this is where our lesson began, when Nehemiah went to help build the wall. So he had to get permission from his king, from the king, to go. And the, in those first ten verses, it talked about how Nehemiah went to the king, and he was looking all sad. And the king asked him, "Why was he looking like that?" And he explained everything to the king and the king did get he asked for permission to go and help and the king gave him permission to go and help them rebuild the wall and then our verses start at 11 it says so I came to Jerusalem and was there three days now after he got permission from the king he set out for Jerusalem and and uh, the king gave him whatever he needed to help build this wall. It said, in our zeal or eagerness to act, we should always remember that God has given us minds to think with, and we should take time to prayerfully consider any situation before we act. Nehemiah then hurried into action immediately. He said that he was in the city three days <coughs> before he did anything. His waiting period gave him time to recoup from the trip and a chance to come up with a plan of action. Now, he wanted to rebuild this, but he had to pray and he had to think. And that's what we should always do before we take on a project. Make sure that we have a good plan and make sure we have consulted God about it. We don't want to go into a project on our own without consulting God. Because sometimes that plan that you have is not God's plan. So a lot of times we do that and we mess up things. But Nehemiah was not like that. He prayed to God and he asked God for everything that he needed. And that's the way we should do. So before we go to verse 11, I would like to know if anyone have any comments on 12 or any part of the lesson so far. Not so far. Okay, we'll go to verse 12. And verse 12 says, and I rose, and I rose in the night, and I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So getting up at night seemed to indicate that he didn't want to reveal his plan to rebuild Jerusalem walls and gates until he was absolutely ready. He didn't share his plans with anyone at this point. God had inspired him to do for what God had inspired him to do for Jerusalem. The only animal they took was the donkey that he had rolled on. His desire
desire for secrecy is also indicated by taking only a few men along with him. So he wanted to go and check out everything, and he wanted to do it in secret. He wanted to do it in secret so he could make up, make his plans and see how bad everything was. So anyone on 12? Any comments? Okay, if not, we'll go to verse 13. It says, And I went out by night by the gates of the valley, even before the dragon wall, well, and to the dumb port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof was consumed with fire. Now this this place was a mess, and they, they still had people living there. And I see why they call uh, Jeremiah the weeping prophet, because he wept over Jerusalem. He wept for the people of Jerusalem. He had a heart for them, and he <clears throat> continued to try to help them. It said, it was still night as he left the city through the valley gate on the west side and went south past Dragon Fountain to the rubbish gate. He wanted to know exactly how much needed to be done before he brought any proposal to the people. Nehemiah now began to describe the survey of Jerusalem. As Nehemiah walked, he inspected the broken walls of the city and the gates that had been destroyed by fire. Can you imagine him just walking through all of this rubbish and looking around at the gate, which was once so beautiful? Because they said the city of Jerusalem was one of the cities. It was like the city of the whole nation, like America used to be the city of the whole nation. And now it was destroyed. It was just rubbish and bricks everywhere. And it was just a mess. Can I stand so, up and interpret? Yes, you can. Just to finish. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to include in here that the walls were so important for Jerusalem. Because the walls covered all the area of the temple and everything. And that wall was important so that the, the Jews wouldn't feel weak. It was like their protection. And I guess in a good example, it's like when we're outside of our house, there's a certain level of security we feel. Mm -hmm. Because we know that God is covering us. But it isn't until we get inside our house, behind those locked doors, that we can say, I'm at home, I'm safe. Right. And that wall was important for the safety of them. Yeah. And without that wall, there was a, a, a level of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that word right? Y'all yes. know what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yes. So th th that's why it was important that that wall be built. And Nehemiah knew that he couldn't do the entire city. Mm -hmm. But when, like Sister Simmons said, when we take our plans to God, he will reveal to us what it is he wants us to do. And that's why Nehemiah focused so hard on that wall because it encompasses, it was a, it was a level of protection. Right. Even with the analytical of that. Yes. there because there were still people living there among all of this rubbish mm -hmm. and they were vulnerable to attack. Mm -hmm. People could come in and attack them and they had to, and that's why Nehemiah wanted to protect the people more mm -hmm. so than to protect the city. He mm -hmm. really wanted the people protected because they were just, they were just out there. Then 14 say, then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast 
that was under me to pay. So Nehemiah kept walking and walking. Well, he was riding the beast, and he got to a point where the animal couldn't go through all the rubbish. So he probably just left the animal and stopped walking and just looking around at all the work that needs to be done so he could go back and give the people a proper inspection report about the about the city and about the gates and how they needed to work on fixing it back up. It said, Leonidas continued his survey of the city by going north to the fountain gate and the king's pool, which was also near the southern tip of Jerusalem. Access to water was a crucial issue for any city, and we know that we have to have water for so, so many different it says, some believe that this refers to the Pool of Siloam associated with King Hezekiah. This is to, this is the to which Jesus would direct a leper he was healing. He directed him to this same pool that they was talking about. It says, as Nehemiah tried to travel up the eastern side of the city, he undoubtedly encountered a great deal of debris and rubble, which hindered his progress so much that there wasn't enough room for his donkey to get through all the rubble. So he was really going around this city trying to see what he needed to do, what needed to be done. So any more comments on 14? Now, uh, Sister Simmons, just let me add in here while we are there that okay. when Nehemiah left King Artaxerxes had given him everything that he needed. Right. Now, if we go back to last week when Ezra <coughs> brought that group, he didn't have all of the, 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 the military forces right. and things right. that Nehemiah had. But Nehemiah had all of the horsemen and everything that he needed. He had the papers. He had everything that he needed to give to them when he got there for what he was going to do. But as you were discussing, he didn't let anybody know what he was doing at that particular time when he got there. And many times when God tells us things to do, we shouldn't share it right away with right. everybody. We have to assess the situation right. because right. if God said it, it's going to come to pass anyway. Yes. But you know, it, it's not for us to uh, to share it just yet. But uh, and this time in between that, now we must first realize that when Nehemiah was talking to the king. This didn't happen overnight. No. This went on for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And then after Nehemiah fasted and he prayed and he moaned and he cried, he did all of those things. And somewhere in my reading, I think it was about three months or four before he came back to the king. And when the king asked him that time, why was he so, why was his countenance so sad? Right. That's when he told him about the plan because God had already put it in his spirit and what he had been praying about and God had given him, you know, the, the okay on all of those things. So it just wasn't an overnight thing. Right. And when he got to Jerusalem, because that was a long journey from right. where he came from yes, to get to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. which means that those three days of rest was real good for him because he rest up from that mm -hmm. long journey that he had been on. Right. So it also gave him time to work out his strategy right. and having a strategy is the good mark, the mark of a good leader, I should right. say. Right. You've got to have a strategy. So that is the mark of an effective leader. And that's what Nehemiah was. Okay. 
And, and that's a good point to bring up because they say he was located a long way, close to 1,000 miles from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and would have to travel that long distance to perform the task. Mm -hmm. The king asked him how long would he be gone, because the mm -hmm. Bible does not reveal the time period mm -hmm. he was spun. Some have estimated it would take three months just to travel to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. to Jerusalem. Right. So he did. He had a long trip. Three months to travel? Mm -hmm. That was, it, it's not like it is today. We can go a thousand miles in a few hours, mm -hmm. but now it took him like three months to get from uh, where he was. He was in mm -hmm. Persia and he was going to Jerusalem. So it took him quite a while to go there. So he did need some rest after he got there, like I said, he came safe. So, on to verse 15. It says, Then went I up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back, and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. So he went back the same way he came in. It said, At this point, while it was still dark, Nehemiah must have continued on foot since there was not enough room for the donkey. At this point, Nehemiah went down into Kidron Valley looking at the wall. Then he turned back and returned and re-entered the city by the gate of the valley on the west side, the same way he had come out. So he was doing all of this during the night, and he was keeping everything a secret because he wanted to, like we said, he wanted to investigate first and see how much work needed to be done, and then he would give his report to the people. Comment from 15, anyone? No? Okay. 16. It say, and the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. So he did not um, tell them any of his plans yet, like uh, Sister Cain had stated. He didn't, he didn't go and run off and tell everybody his plans, and a lot of times we can't do that. We have to search out the plans first and see how everything is going before we just go jump in and telling everyone. And we can't always tell people what we're going to do because as we will see later on in the lesson that he had some backlash about trying to rebuild the wall. So sometimes we have to just be quiet, just sit still for a while. Things that we cannot do we have to leave them alone and let God do what we can do. So it said he was very thorough on making this point, for he mentioned every possible part of the population. So he meant he uh, mentioned the other Jews, the priests, the leaders, the officials, or anyone else who would be taking part in the work. The point here is that for the time being, Nehemiah continued to keep his plans in secret. Okay, we're coming from 16, anyone? Um, okay. I want to say, okay. it's really the same thing you just said. <laughs> but, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, if you go back to verse 10, which is not in our lesson, mm -hmm. it talks about the reason why he didn't say anything he knew he would come up against opposition. Right. And we know people who do not want to see God's work moving forward. Amen. Amen. That's right. And anything we try to do for the upbuilding of the kingdom, whoever is against God is going to always talk about his plan when you present it to them. Right. And that's why Sister, as Sister Kane said and, and Sister Senator, we all are in the Sometimes there are some things that people, it's not that it's a secret, 
but it's just some things that they do not need to know until the right time when God reveals it. Right. And when we're working according to God's plan, everything falls in order. Yes. And he gives us instructions on what to do. And that's why I give so much credit to Nehemiah because he prayed, as we said at the very beginning of the lesson, he prayed about everything. everything. Yes. And you know, Sister Simmons, I was thinking about Nehemiah and him being a cup bearer. Mm -hmm. And the king had so much confidence in yes. Nehemiah. Yes. Because yes. first of all, he was a person of integrity. Yes. He was an honest person. Mm -hmm. And he was a dependable person. Mm -hmm. And I just believe if I had a cup bearer and he come and ask me, can he go? I would have to take second thoughts about that. But when God's plan is in motion, Nothing can stop it. Amen. Amen. Nothing can <laughs> yeah. stop it. That is so true. Nothing uh -huh. can stop God's plan. And Sister Simmons, while we're there, also now Nehemiah's first step toward rebuilding Jerusalem walls was to assess the damage, which That's we true. just talked about. Right. That right. was caused by the Babylonian siege, which had happened many years before. So, and the Bible encourages us by example and command to regularly assess our personal spiritual condition. All right, all we right. have to keep ourselves up. Not, we, we, we're not just concerned about building the wall. We have walls that we have built up yes, as well. Yes, yes. And we have to uh, uh, assess those uh, spiritual conditions from time to time. And you know, if you read Romans 12, one and three, it tells us, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters by the mercies of God to present your bodies, living sacrifices, holy and well pleasing to God, which yes. is your reasonable service. Yes, yes. And do not be conformed to this world so, you know, I, we have to assess ourselves as well. Yes, yes. Amen. Okay. And wait, one more thing. It's <laughs> never, it's, it's never, never a wise, uh, it's never wise to jump into a work or a ministry without first learning the nature and the scope of the work. So don't just jump into something because you get this idea and you just yeah. jump and jump into it and you ain't thought, gave it no, no real thought, you ain't prayed about it, you haven't consulted God in any kind of way. That's never a good idea to just jump into it because it came to you. That is so true. Or somebody told you. Right. <laughs> that is so true. And you know, many times, and I'm sorry, many times when you, when I heard Sister Williams say, because somebody told you, that's many times, that's what happens to a lot of us, you know, somebody is saying, you know, you sh just because you said something good, you know, you should be teaching Sunday school. Right. Girl, you better get up in that pulpit, you're supposed to be a minister. <laughs> Did God tell you that? Has no. he talked with you about it? Mm -hmm. Have you talked with God about it? Right. Did you say, well, Lord, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? You know, help me with this. But, you know, just because somebody has said, we jump on it. That is so true. And we do that a lot of times. And people do encourage us to uh -huh. do things that it's not even in our calling. Uh -huh. Our calling may not be what this person wants you to jump into. Right. And then a lot of times we don't pray about it. Right. We just go jump right on into it because they said so. Uh -huh. And it ends up being a mess a lot of times. Uh -huh. So it, we should always consult the Lord about praying that right. we right. Yeah. are to attempt to uh -huh. go into. I remember one time at, when I was at another church, uh, the Lord gave me something to do. And I knew it was the Lord that gave it to me. I knew. But I continued to consult.
spoke to him about it, and I really went on into this project. It was a big project. It was a, a project that the Lord had told me to get 100 people in Sunday school one Sunday. And so, and and when he when he told me this, then I said, Lord, that's a that's a big job. Matter of fact, we had 135 people oh, that wow. Sunday. Praise so I knew Lord. it was the Lord. So mm -hmm. when you when you know it's the Lord that's telling you to do things that you think is just mm -hmm. out raging, you know, when you know it's the Lord, go on, step on out there and do it because He will not let you down. Mm -hmm. He will see to you doing what He has. So we, uh, we're going on to uh, verse 17. It says, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that I that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the walls of Jerusalem that we no more a reproach. And that reproach means this disgrace. It said, Nehemiah revealed why he had come to Jerusalem. Now he's going to share everything with the people. It said, in order to arouse action on an issue, a leader must first convince the people that a problem exists and then get them to focus on it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they couldn't help but to see that it existed, could they? And then it said, Nehemiah began saying, See what trouble we are in because Jerusalem is in ruins and its gates are destroyed. They were weak and vulnerable to attack. And we talked about that. Nehemiah was well aware, and the people should have been also, that it was impossible to carry on a normal life with the basic elements of their city destroyed. They, they can't live normally in that city like they were doing. Right. They were they were existing in that uh -huh. city. They were not living. They were just uh -huh. existing there. It said because the city was in ruins, the people were considered a disgrace by their neighbors who treated them disrespectfully and hurled insults at them because of their weakened condition. Now the people see how weak they are. And and I can imagine them teasing them about their God. Look at, look why your God letting you live like this. And you know, they, uh, people can be very hurtful. Mm -hmm. They can hurt you with their words. It's a Nehemiah point was that if the people would work together, the state of affairs would end. Working to reveal the walls would be a way of glorifying God. Nehemiah was appealing to the people's sense of pride. No, he said to them, let's rebuild the, the city walls and put an end to our disgrace. Mm -hmm. So he wanted them to come on and get with him, and he told them how bad it was, and he had gone out and inspected the walls and all the things surrounding the walls and how bad it was, and then he had brought it back to the people, and he told them, Let's rebuild the city walls and put an end to our disgrace. Because there was a disgrace that those people were living there in that city with the walls all torn down like that. Any more comments from 17? Mm -hmm. I, just okay. want, I just wanted to add that um, that um, God's timing is perfect. 
because at the right time, after Nehemiah's assessment, he went and he um, gave his report to the leaders. Right, right. And y'all, sometimes it all, all it takes is one person with that flame right. to set a fire, amen? amen. One person one. with a vision. Right. And when you take that vision to the person, and they catch on, you got a big fire, and you can accomplish a lot. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can accomplish so much, but we are so busy sometimes shooting down somebody's idea or what God has given them because we don't want to have a part. But it was just like, it was just like, it was just like it was, I'm saying I said that three times. What I'm trying to say is, it was just perfect timing, mm -hmm. you know. So we can't shut down what someone brings because we don't know if that's from God. And if it is, he'll reveal it to us too. Mm -hmm. And we become a part of it. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And the peace of the people agreed with Nehemiah to. And also. We must remember that uh, Jerusalem was the holy city, yes, it mm -hmm. was. The site of God's temple. Mm -hmm. And at one time before the Babylonians did all of this tearing down, Jerusalem was a beautiful city. Right. Mm -hmm. It was a major city. Right. And as Sister Simon had said in the beginning, it was built in a strategic place right. because they had to have the water. Right. It had to be close to, uh, it had to have access to uh, the, the businesses where right. they could, the trade and, and all of those things. Right. And they had all of that there in the city because this was where God's temple was. Right. Now Ezra had come back and did the temple and now, as we stated before, Nehemiah is doing the wall because everything, everything out of all of that is still in, in ruins and the people are not being protected. Right. Now, there had been others that came because Zerubbabel had brought a group back. Right. And he tried to reconstruct and right. rebuild, right. but the, the, the enemy got to got him. To he was not a strong leader, right. and, and, and they got to him, and, and the job was stopped. He right. couldn't finish the rebuild. And then here come uh, Ezra. He did what he was supposed to do because he was there to rebuild the temple. But we must understand that without the walls, the temple was still unprotected, right. as were all of the people. So that's where Nehemiah comes in to to, uh, to get the walls rebuilt because they had burned those walls, y'all. They, right. they burned them. Right. And they, that means that they couldn't just pick them up and shake them off and, you know, put them back together. They, they were burned. So that's why Nehemiah had to get all of these instructions, I mean, everything that he needed from the king, he presented all of these papers to who they needed to go to. He got the timber, he got whatever it was that he needed to rebuild. All of that was already in place. And all he had to do was present this to the leaders, which is what he did in verse 17. And, and, and they all got together and started, the job was, the wheel was in motion. Right. That leads us to 18. And 18 says, Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. You know, it's always good to have good followers. When you have good followers that make good leaders, mm -hmm. you know, so you don't want a, a bunch of, you'd rather have two or three good workers than to have 10 or 12 bad complainers. Mm -hmm. So he, so these people were willing to get you high. 
find him and help him. It said, Nehemiah said that the hand of my God, which was good upon me, he didn't take any credit for it himself. All the credit was given to the hand of my God. Mm -hmm. God did what Nehemiah could not do. He moved on the heart of the king to allow Nehemiah to go to Judah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The king didn't believe in God, but he was sympathetic to Nehemiah because he had done a great job for him. That's something we all, all need to remember. You know, sometimes people that not in God will help you more than some people that are in God. Mm -hmm. So the king saw that Nehemiah was serious and he saw that Nehemiah was a good employee to him. So he granted whatever Nehemiah had asked him to do. It said, our job may be working for the most pagan or pagan. But if we work as if we are working unto the Lord, we are in fact serving him, and he will bless us for it. Then the people did their part when they strengthened their hands for this good work. When there is something to be done, do you just stand back and wait for God to do everything? Or do you do what you can and leave what you can't do up to God? Do we do that? A lot of times we don't do that. We try to do it all and don't even consider what God can do. It's that God wants, wants to and very often does work through people instead of accomplishing his will on his own. You know, God uses people to help us. Mm -hmm. A lot of times we don't realize that, but when people come to help you, a lot of times God sent those people to help you. And you could constantly ask him, God, I need help. God, I need help. And he sent you help. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times you don't even accept them. Oh, I don't know that person. He can't do anything. But he's there. God has sent him there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we don't realize God has sent him there. And we ignore him or don't let him do what he should do. Mm -hmm. You know, so a lot of times we have to really pray over all these things when we're, when we have projects to do. Mm -hmm. You call God, you call on the Lord, and you ask the Lord to help you, and when he sends help, you don't accept it. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that picture? Something is wrong with that picture. Mm -hmm. It said many of his miracles, Jesus sometimes used others to do the things they could while he did what he was humbly impossible. So a lot of times we can't do things. We can go so far mm -hmm. and we have to stop and God has to take it on from there. It say they respond, let's start rebuilding. And they got ready to start the work. Mm -hmm. The people were anxious now. They had heard uh, all that Nehemiah had told them and explained to them and told them that God's hand was up on this, and uh, he had gotten them all excited to do this work. You know, it's good to have someone in position to encourage the people. And so, and that's what Nehemiah was. He was in a position to encourage these people to come on, let's do this work. Let's get started. God is with us. He was telling them all of this. And so they were all ready to do God's work. Mm -hmm. Any more comments on 18? Well, um, uh, as we were talking about before, uh, Nehemiah had, he had the, the, he had evidence to prove that uh, God's hand was at work on the people's behalf. Right. In, in, in the past, when they were trying to rebuild, they had been, uh, had a lot of opposition, so mm -hmm. they didn't do anything. Right. But this time, this time, Artaxerxes had given his approval to the work to be done in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. But more so, more than King Artaxerxes, 
The true king of kings was the one who was in ultimate control, and that was God, because he had given his approval as well. Right, right. Now, Nehemiah was so convincing that the people committed themselves to the common good. Mm -hmm. So they all were in agreement because he had um, presented his, his, his plan to them so well. Then a second lesson in ne Nehemiah's leadership for us is that we need to realize that when we are doing something, we need buy-in from all of the people. So he had buy-in from Jerusalem's leaders, mm -hmm. you know, and that was a part of his success in rebuilding the wall. And that's just like now, our church leaders today, when they forget that they need the buy-in of the congregation, mm -hmm. then they're in for a rude awakening. Right, right. Because they have to have, the in order for a ministry or anything to succeed, you only get it with the support of the congregation. Amen. Amen. Any more comments on 18? Okay. If not, we'll go to 19. 19 says, but when Sambalik and Horonite and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed, they laughed as to scorn and despise us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? <laughs> Whenever God's people began to take action for the Lord, it's not surprising that enemies will come out of the woodwork. Experiencing opposition and difficulties does not necessarily mean we are doing something wrong. It means just the opposite. Naming these three indicates that Nehemiah and Judah were virtually surrounded by enemies. The three men mentioned here saw this undertaking by the people as a silly thing and ridiculed them. They laughed and scorned and despised the people and their efforts to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. You're going to always have opposition, aren't you? When you're trying to do something for the Lord, there's always opposition. Amen. It said they were hoping to discourage the workers. This is why, this is the way it often is with God's enemies. They seek to instill fear and doubt. These men also threaten to make trouble when they act. Will ye rebel against the king? Now, not knowing that the king had okayed all this. Now, see, this is what you call meddling. <laughs> they were meddling in something that they had no control over. Amen. Now, the king had already given uh, Nehemiah position, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. gave, him, gave them the okay to do all of this. And they are never not knowing that uh, he had given them uh, permission to do this. It said they were referring to the king of Persia who didn't know, they didn't know yet that he had authorized this mission. Okay. Now he had authorized a mission and here they are not knowing that he had authorized and they were meddling. That's what you call meddling mm -hmm. in something that don't even concern you. And a lot of people do that. They meddle in things that don't concern them. They don't know anything about the about what's going on, but they have to put their two cents in. Yeah. So, um, any, more, any more comments on that one? I, I just kind of want to throw in there, um, okay. Sister Simmons, and you are absolutely right. And when I was talking earlier about the king, and I didn't know if I would let my cup bear or go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and these are words from our pastor, which reminded me that the, this was the Lord's doing because the king 
didn't, um, and Ezra didn't want them to rebuild the city, but he has had a change of heart. Mm -hmm. And the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of God. That's Proverbs 21 and 1. Okay. Words from our pastor, amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, our last verse. It says, Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, we his servants, will arise and build. But he have no portion or no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. So in other words, <laughs> Nehemiah was telling them, this is none of your business. Mm -hmm. Y'all have no right to be here, no say so over anything. So you all need to just butt out. <laughs> But it said, Nehemiah responded to the attacks from their opposition with great confidence. He said, then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we have to stand up. Mm -hmm. We have to stand up for our rights mm -hmm. in front of the enemy. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan is there. He comes to destroy you know, so we have to stand up to the devil a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. It said, Nehemiah had requested success from God. He had already uh, confronted God. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah had already confronted God, and God had given Nehemiah the okay. Mm -hmm. So he didn't, he didn't have to worry about opposition in this. It said, now he expressed confidence that the sovereign God of heaven will prosper the people and his servant will arise and build, meaning that no matter what these scoffers said, they would complete the building program. Then Nehemiah said, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. In other words, these three men, <coughs> Sambalit, Tobiah, and Geshem, had no basis to speak at all because Nehemiah said, they had no portion or share in Jerusalem, nor did they have any right to claim to Jerusalem. They had no right there. After ne <coughs> and neither did they have any memorial or historic claim to the city. In essence, Nehemiah was telling these men that they had no inheritance in Jerusalem. God had given the land to Israel, and he would watch over his people. So Nehemiah one was not gonna come down off the walls because I remember reading Nehemiah where he was up on the wall and these scoffers was down there calling him down and he said, I will not come down off the walls. So he just kept building. Doing great work. Yeah, yeah, he was doing a great work for the Lord and he was not paying them any attention. And that's how we have to do a lot of times is just to ignore the enemy mm -hmm. and go on and do what God has for us to do and God is going to make it all right. Mm -hmm. Amen. So now I'll turn it back over and hand uh, Sister Kay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, we have really enjoyed this lesson today. And Sister Simmons did it just on time because we are right at the 11 o'clock hour. But before we close out, just let me tell you, there was a story that I was reading about <clears throat> a father who was watching his son mm -hmm. from the window and the son was trying to move this big rock. Oh, yeah. And he tried everything he could, but he could not get the leverage that he needed to tip the rock over. Right. So then the father walked outside and asked him, he said, can you lift the rock? And he said, no, dad, I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And he said, are you using all the strength you have? He said, yes, mm -hmm. I just can't move it. I'm using all the strength that's within me. Mm -hmm. So then the dad said, no, you didn't use all of your strength because you haven't asked me for help. Right, so right. that lets us know that we need help we need in help. everything that we undertake. We need God's help yes. in whatever we are doing. Yes. Now, Nehemiah 
would have many rocks and rubble to move in rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. But heavenly and earthly hand would provide him with more than enough help. More than enough. With yes. that, we're going to pray. Father God, we thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. We thank you for what our hearts have felt. We thank you, Lord, for all those who tuned in to this Sunday school hour yes, today. Yes, and we pray you, that they, too, have heard something that is going to help them throughout the rest of their lives. Yes. If they get nothing else, Lord, we pray that they will remember that you are the source. You mm -hmm. are our strength. Yes. And that we must pray in everything that we do, everything that we need. Yes. We pray yes. and ask you. In the name of Jesus, I pray right now, as we leave this place, that you would go with us, guide us, and keep us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.